Okay, good morning and welcome to today's Finance Committee meeting. My name is Councilmember Daniel Drum and I'm chair of the committee. We've been joined by Councilmember Steve Matteo, Councilmember Adrian Adams, Councilmember Andy Cohen, Councilmember Keith Powers, Councilmember Barry Grudenchuk. Uh, today the committee will be hearing intro 1038, sp sponsored by Councilmember Barry Grudenchuk, myself, and Councilmember Kalman Yeager. This bill would increase the threshold for when an income producing property is required to provide a statement of income and expense certified by, uh, certified by a certified public accountant in order to receive an assessment reduction by the tax commission. Currently, income producing properties with an assessed value of $1 million or more are required to submit such certification. This bill would increase that threshold to properties with an assessed value of $5 million or more indexed to inflation. Each year, the Department of Finance values every property within the city to determine its value for property tax purposes. This value is called an assessment. The method of calculating value that DOF uses varies depending on the class and type of property. By January 15th, DOF publishes the tentative assessment role, setting forth the tentative assessment of each property for the next tax year beginning in July, on July 1st. The tentative assessment role is subject to modification until the final assessment role is closed around May 25th. Uh, this is where the Tax Commission comes in. The Tax Commission is the city's forum for independent administrative review of real property tax assessments set, for, set by DOF. A property owner may challenge their tentative assessment on one of four bases. Uh, one, a misclassification. Two, excessiveness. Three, in, uh, inequality. Or four, unlawfulness. As part of the application for review, income producing properties, with the exclusion of multiple or other dwellings, which are occupied by fewer than seven families, must report all income received or accrued and all expenses paid or incurred in the operation of the property. This information is used by the Tax Commission to help determine the assessments for these types of properties. Income producing properties with an assessed value of $1 million or more must have a certified public accountant audit the building's income an expense statement and certify that they are free from material misstatement. The $1 million threshold was first set by local law in 1973 and has not been adjusted since then. This is the issue that we are here to learn more about today, and I look forward to hearing the testimony of Ellen Hoffman, President of the Tax Commission, on this bill. Before I turn the mic over to uh, Councilmember Grudenchik, the sponsor of the legislation for his statement, I'd like to thank Rebecca Chasen and Emra Edev from the Finance Division, and Sebastian McGuire and Evia Cardoso from my staff for their work in putting together today's hearings. Uh, Councilmember Gudenchik. Thank you very much, Chair Drum. I'm just going to make uh, very brief remarks. I want to thank my colleagues as well, and thank you for giving this bill a hearing. Uh, this is basically uh, common sense legislation. Uh, I was 13 uh, when the city uh, last took this up, so that'll give you some idea. 58 now, so uh, for those of you who are math challenged. Um, decades ago, the city uh, exempted income producing properties valued at a million dollars or less uh, from the requirement of producing certified financial statements when requesting uh, lowering of their property taxes. Uh, inflation has basically rendered this uh, exemption useless. You would be very hard pressed in the city of New York uh, to find an income producing property for under a million dollars. and. Uh, what we're really asking um, the city to do with this legislation um, is to bring it up to $5 million, which is still a little lower than where it would be inflation-wise. Um, the other reason that we're asking for this is that um, the cost of certified financial statements have also increased tremendously. We are uh, today in this bill uh, proposing raising the exemption to a $5 million of assessed valuation and indexing that value so that we do not have to revisit this any time in the future. And that's really essentially what the bill does. I want to thank you for giving the bill a hearing, and I look forward to hearing the testimony from the Tax Commission and others. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, we will now hear from President Hoffman after she is sworn in by counsel. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes, I do. Okay, please begin. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Drum and members of the committee for inviting me to speak on intro 1038 this morning. And thanks to uh, Council Member Grudenchik and the other sponsors for their leadership in, in bringing this bill uh, to this point. 
Uh, my name is Ellen Hoffman, and I'm the president of the New York City Tax Commission. Let me start by saying that I fully support the primary purpose of this bill in increasing the dollar threshold for tax commission applications for correction requiring the certification of a certified public accountant. The tax commission is sympathetic to the burden placed on owners of modest sized properties having to pay accountants several thousand dollars to certify their income and expense statements and we agree with the proposed increase in the threshold to $5 million. As the chair mentioned, the current threshold of $1 million was adopted in 1973. I don't have perfect statistics to illustrate all of the changes and relevant facts since then, but I think I can give you a good idea of how things have changed. In 1977, the total actual assessed value of all property in the city was under $40 million. For fiscal 2018, the total taxable actual assessed value was over $251 billion. In 1986, the total assessed value of all parcels filing appeals with the Tax Commission was just over $40 billion. In, for fiscal 2019, that total is over $233 billion. In fiscal 1993, the number of applications filed with the Tax Commission for properties having an assessed value of over 750,000 was about 10,500. For fiscal 2019, the number of applications filed for properties with an assessed value of over 450,000 was over $39,000. Uh, although it's not a perfect comparison, I feel confident in saying that the number of applications requiring an accountant certification has increased by at least 300% in the last 15 years. In short, the million dollar threshold does not have the same significance today as it did when it was adopted 45 years ago. With the increase in assessed values in the 45 years since that threshold was adopted, owners of what are now modest sized properties are burdened with the expense of hiring accountants to issue the certifications. Last year of the 54,557 applications filed with the Tax Commission, 25,209 were for properties having an assessed value of $1 million or more. But only 69, over, slightly over 69,000 were for properties having an assessed value of $5 million or more. As a result, with this legislative change, as many as 18,000 applicants will no longer have to provide that certification. However, while we support the increase in the threshold for very practical reasons, we strongly object to the provision requiring the threshold to be indexed to inflation on a yearly basis. Applications with the Tax Commission are due March 1st each year for tax classes 2, 3, and 4. Many are filed shortly after the notice of property value is issued by the Finance Department in mid-January. Our forms and instructions have to be printed by December to have them available to applicants. The average annual increase in the consumer price index each year is not released until mid-January, so it would be impossible for us to incorporate that change into our forms and instructions and to effectively communicate the new threshold to applicants in time. Moreover, the most recent increase was just over 2%. That represents a very small change in assessed value to justify the practical difficulties of adjusting the certification threshold each year. Applicants might incur an unnecessary expense because they were unaware of a slight change in the threshold. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to address you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, and thank you for your testimony. So let me start off by asking you a couple of questions. Um, in its memorandum supporting the threshold change from $1 million to $5 million, the Committee on Condemnation and Tax uh, Certorari of the New York City Bar stated that a survey of their clients indicated that the cost of having an accountant audit a building's records and prepare the certification would cost $10,000 or more. Do you have any data or knowledge about how much the certification process might cost? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the first part of the question. So in, in a memorandum supporting the threshold change from $1 million to $5 million, the Committee on Condemnation and Tax Certiorari, I think that's how you say it, uh, of the New York City Bar stated that a survey of their clients indicated that the cost of having an accountant audit a building's records and prepare the certification could cost $10,000 or more. So do you have any data or knowledge on how much the certification process might cost? I don't have any data. Um, I believe it certainly is 
over you know, a few thousand dollars, but um, we don't have direct information about what individual applicants um, or their representatives or accountants charge for that service. So do you have any information about what the process that the accountant um, might follow, uh, and can you explain what it entails? Um, I'm not an accountant, so I hesitate to comment on, on what their professional responsibility or duties are. Have you heard any complaints or grievances from applicants that undergoing the audit and certification process is either burdensome or expensive, and ultimately that's what I'm really trying to get at? Um, I have heard from time to time since I've been president that the threshold at this point is too low. Um, so I have heard complaints along those lines, yes. Okay. Uh, because this bill would raise the threshold for when an application needs documentation certified by an accountant, um, you testified that about 18,000 fewer certifications would be filed. How, if at all, would this impact the ability of the Tax Commission to conduct a thorough review? So the certification of the accountant is only one element of the information that the Tax Commission requests and requires that we use in our process in reviewing assessed values. It doesn't relieve the Tax Commission of its obligation or um, desire to review the individual income and expense information provided. It gives us just one level of comfort, but otherwise we still look at that information to see whether it is consistent with other information we have about that particular property or similar properties, such as a rent roll, uh, the property description, whether there's commercial space in the property, uh, the, the number of square feet, and so on. So we continue to do, uh, whether there's a certification or not, we do a thorough examination of the information on the application. So does the Commission's workload or workflow differ uh, when you're reviewing applications that are accompanied by an accountant certification and reviewing those applications that are not? No. No. Are there different levels of scrutiny given to the certified versus non-certified applications? No. Many of the um, income producing properties that are required to file income and expense statements as part of their appeals must also file real property income tax and expense statements or RPIEs uh, with the Department of Finance in order for the DOF to determine the assessed value in the first uh, instance. What are the main differences between the RPIE and the income and expense schedule that the tax commission uh, requires to be submitted as part of the application for the assessment reduction? The primary difference is timing. The RPIE statement is required to be filed by June 1st of the immediate succeeding year. So uh, for in 2017, on June 1st of 17, property owners were required to file that statement for the 2016 year. For applications of correction filed, and those are used for the, creating the assessments for the 2018-19 tax year. The applications the Tax Commission receives in 2018 are required to include 2017 information, so we're looking at information that is one year more current. Um, in terms of the types of information required, um, there are slight differences, but they're not significant. So uh, why does the Tax Commission require a different filing rather than uh, using the RPIE that a property has already prepared? Primarily, it gives us more current information, um, but it, there's also a distinction in terms of um, tax secrecy. RPIE information is tax secrets. Tax, the information the Tax Commission receives is not. We do allow property owners to submit um, tax RPIE information to us. Um, in your 2017 annual report, you noted that the Department of Finance may appear at hearings and offer written submissions in defense of the assessment, and that for the past several years, representatives from DOF have participated in a number of hearings, quote unquote. How frequently does the DOF uh, participate in hearings, and do you find their presence useful or beneficial? in your review? They primarily participate in hearings on properties with 
substantial values that are the very highest value properties uh, don't how would you define that um, as for 40 million dollar assessed values and higher um, they don't tend to come in on the smaller properties for the most part um, their presence does help all parties at the hearing achieve consensus on information such as square footage um, to reconcile discrepancies or to give the finance department an opportunity to present information that they may have about the property where we, there might be inconsistencies between information submitted to us and allows us to reconcile those differences which assists everyone in avoiding um, having assessments that then have to be reviewed in the future that can be more consistent between finance and, and the tax commission. So would you find their participation, increased participation, helpful? It's somewhat helpful, yes. Has the tax commission identified any trends or repeat issues with respect to errors that the DOF has made in assessments in the cases where you find in favor of the property owner? There's not really a trend that I can point to. There's, um, each case really stands on its own. Um, is there a mechanism for collecting that information or is it just anecdotal? It would be anecdotal. Um, the council is aware that the DOF is very close to rolling out its new property tax system uh, or PTS after many years of developing the program. What role has the tax commission had in developing this new system? So the system that the finance department has been using for many years incorporates well, elements of that system are the, are the systems that the tax commission uses in doing its work. So PTS actually is replacing all of our computer systems that integrate with that. So um, members of my staff have been extremely involved in developing those components of the system for the last three years. And we're still working with them to um, get it ready to roll out this year. So what features of the new system do you think will be most beneficial? The availability of the, the more easy access to all of the information about a particular property. Uh, it's a little more seamless in terms of the ability to look at view information. Um, right now there's a couple of different systems so you have to keep signing in and out of systems to look at information. Was there anything that was not put into the system that you wish was put into the system? We're working on some additional um, components to assist our work that um, we're, are now generated outside of finance's existing computer system um, that we're gonna try to work through and have use that system to generate reports and um, various kinds of elements that we use in our work. Okay, then the charter requires that the tax commission produce an annual report detailing the tax commission's work. Uh, we find that useful and helpful to us, but it's not available on your websites. Uh, do you have, uh, the, uh, I think, um, let me just see, uh, the two uh, most recent reports are 2017 and 16. Um, why do you only have two years worth of those reports available online? We can look to put older ones on the website. I think the practice had been in the past to just have the two most recent years and not to have um, older data. Okay, and the charter um, calls for the tax commission to have six commissioners in addition to the president, but currently there are only four uh, positions filled. What is the status of the effort to fill those other positions? We have, over the last four years, been looking to recruit qualified individuals. So there's one requirement that the tax commission members have a representative of one of the each, each of the five boroughs. Right now, we don't have representatives of the Bronx and Staten Island, and we have had um, a great deal of difficulty identifying qualified and interested individuals to do that kind of work from those boroughs um, who are interested in the position. 
has that inhibited your ability to be able to do the work that's necessary or the work the workload that you have to deal with it hasn't significantly the commissioners work part time during our hearing season uh, so it's a small incremental burden but it gets spread among the, the rest of us and just for the public's understanding as well can you explain uh, the process by which a person gets appointed to the tax commission initially they have to meet requirements in terms of education and background and as I said there's a residency requirement as well they also have to be um, appointed by the mayor with the advice and consent of the City Council and be reappointed on a six-year basis so it requires someone who has the proper qualifications who's willing to go through that process we also one of the inhibitors is we need someone who is not too closely tied to the real estate business where they would have a conflict by doing these kinds of cases um, where it might be a conflict with their outside employment so it tends to be people who are retired from active work in the real estate field but who have the relevant experience okay good I just want to say that we have been joined by council members Van Bremer Cornegie, Cumbo, and Rosenthal. I'm going to turn the questions over now to uh, Councilmember Gudenchik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a few brief questions. I uh, want to thank uh, Ms. Hoffman uh, for being here today, and I certainly appreciate your support of the bill. Um, though you uh, w were not able to give an estimate on what the savings might be, uh, my council, who is actually got his start in the sec at the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission informs me that, you know, an audit like this would be in the thousands and thousands of dollars. So if we took a figure of $5,000 times 18, we would be saving New York City businesses uh, roughly $90 million a year if this legislation is passed and signed by the mayor. So I think that's very significant. Um, I do note your objection um, to the indexing. And I appreciate it uh, as sponsor of the legislation. Um, and I realize that the rate of inflation is fairly low these days and has been for quite a while. Would the Tax Commission have an objection if we did the indexing a year later? So it, we understand that you have to go to print with your forms um, in December, and I appreciate that. But there's no reason that we couldn't update. We'd be lagging a year, and that seems to me a reasonable solution to the problem. The Tax Commission is willing, you know, and certainly understands and agrees with the concept of having some sort of mechanism in the, in the legislation to adjust the threshold periodically so we don't have to revisit it. I'd um, be happy to discuss possible alternatives. No, because I'm not going to be here in 45 years. I don't expect to be. I'll be. Well, not to be here. Danny may be, but I won't. But um, so that really would, would seem to me, and if you go digital, then it would be, you'd be able to adjust it on the fly. Um, although I could see cases where that could create a problem also because some people might download a form earlier than others. But if we did it, um, th there's one index, we know what it is, and I don't think that should be a problem, an, an undue burden on the commission. It's not so much a burden on the commission. My concern is that um, an index number is not going to be a, a nice, clean, round figure for people to keep in their heads. Um, and to know when the accountant needs to provide that certification or not. Um, we could do it in increments of 10, with 10,000? Increments, incremental numbers certainly are a, a possibility, yes. Okay, all right. That's really uh, what I wanted to talk about. I, I saw your testimony and that's really, I'm, I'm very happy that you support this. I think it's very much common sense legislation that obviously is at least 40 some odd years overdue. So I thank you for your support and uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for allowing me the time to speak this morning. Okay, Council Member Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I'd like to thank um, my colleague, uh, Council Member Grudenchik, for taking the lead on this important legislation. It is very long overdue. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman, for being here with us this morning. Uh, just a quick question um, uh, about bringing us uh, into the 21st century. Um, I didn't hear anything referenced um, in prior questions regarding exploring going digital. 
um, for the commission. Are there any plans? With the new computer system that the finance department is implementing, um, there are greater possibilities of going more digital with our process. One um, limitation is that by city charter, our applications need to be notarized. We need an original notarized signature. There are possible alternatives, but it would require a legislative fix at least to that component. We have a new head of our IT division and he and I have been discussing incremental things that we can do once this new computer system is in place and all the bugs have been worked out, so we're not trying to do too many things at the same time. Um, but we are exploring what we can do to move us into the 21st, or at least the 20th century. That's good. Uh, legislation aside, do you have a particular timeline that you're looking at in, in starting or completion? We are actually sitting down with representatives of Do It to talk about what kind of support they can provide for um, our various options that we're exploring. Okay, thank you. Okay, Council Member Powers, followed by Rosenthal. Council Member Grant, you covered most of my questions about um, alternate ways to, or sort of around the uh, adjusting for the future. But I wanted to just ask a follow up question to his. Is, are there other ways that you've considered to be able to adjust for the future if it's not, if it's not uh, doing a sort of automatic adjuster based on inflation or the suggestion he makes? Are there other ways that you could think of that we could can adjust for the future? I think having a stepped increase by a dollar amount, whether it's 10,000 or some larger number on a longer term, that would be predictable and knowable well in advance by all parties in the process um, okay. is a reasonable option. Great, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate your testimony and Council Member Grudenchik, really appreciate your bill. Um, so thank you for that. I want to follow up a little bit on the question that Council Member Adams just asked and she's very polite and I'm less polite. So um, I didn't hear a timetable. Do you have a, do you have a goal in mind for when um, I guess it's a two-step question. Do you happen to know if DOF has a goal in mind for when their computer system would be completed? And this is a question that the committee's been asking since the beginning of our tenure in 2014. And then secondly, do you have a sense of the timing, you know, for you? My understanding is that the current time the new system is going to come in at the beginning of 2019. Mm -hmm. And the enormity of the impact of switching computer systems on the operation of the tax commission really can't be overstated. We have, we're an agency of 39 staff, and that actually includes staff of the New York City Tax Appeals Tribunal, which is part of the Office of Administrative Tax Appeals. We receive over 55,000 applications every year that have to be processed and reviewed carefully before the end of the year. So in the course of trying to process all of those applications and try to implement some electronic system, it's juggling a lot of things at the same time. And I don't want to put the cart before the horse by moving forward with what might be a fairly pricey contractual program to go to a digital application while we're getting used to a new computer system to process those applications. I'd like to have that be completely seamless right now and then start working on it. But we are looking into having um, small incremental steps such as forms that can be completed online and printed so that we can read that data digitally and store it digitally instead of in the over 100 filing cabinets that we have now. Um, you know, I, New York City's big. That, that's what we all have agreed, that we all as public servants know that we have a big city. And our understanding is our city government is funded 
appropriately for our really big jobs. I get that. Um, and I understand this must be a very complex thing. I don't doubt it. And I also hear you saying that you've started that work already with the IT person. Of course you have. That's great. Um, do you think that uh, there's any way in this change um, in the law that it would necessitate your office to have more than 39 staff? The, this particular piece of legislation? No, not at all. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, I think that's going to be it then. Thank you very much uh, for coming in. We appreciate your testimony. And we do have two others who are going to now. Thank you. Come up. Uh, Peter Blonde from New York City Bar and Real Estate Tax Review um, Board, I think. And the uh, Glenn Boren from New York City uh, Bar Association and Real Estate Tax Review Bar Association. Excuse me. Okay, I think we're ready to start. Would you like to start? Would you, good morning. My name is Peter Blonde. I am the immediate past chair of the uh, Condemnation and Tax Certiorari Committee of the New York City Bar Association. I want to thank you for taking the time, all of you for taking the time to consider uh, our committee's proposal that this long-standing threshold be updated uh, I don't want to be uh, too repetitive. We've covered statistics already. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight that has not been highlighted yet today is that the accountant certification does not provide the justification for a reduction at the task commission. It is merely the vehicle which permits a substantive hearing. All of these taxpayers are being denied substantive review at present who cannot afford or find a CPA with the time on short notice to perform an audit uh, along uh, these, these requirement levels. Uh, to give you an idea of client X for most of us who deal with the taxpayers, I'll receive a call in late January or early February of any given year over the course of my 20-year career, and you'll have a taxpayer with an assessment a year prior of, say, 500000 paying roughly $50,000 a year in real estate taxes, who wakes up upon receiving their, their property uh, adjustment uh, in late January of that year and find that they've been assessed at over a million now and that the city has targeted them to start paying taxes uh, of, of roughly 100,000 in the next several years. They call somebody like myself and I explain to them the paperwork required and the, the time frame involved, and most of these are mom and pop type operators whom have never had cause to have a CPA on retainer. Uh, they, they use a, a regular uh, public accountant. And um, they start calling in February to certified public accountants, uh, typically of, of, of larger house size, and are told it'll be $10,000 and more for them to complete this audit within the next month or so. Uh, the city deadline for these income and expenses is March 24th of each year. Uh, and, of course, for the IRS or State of New York, you don't have to give those figures in until much later, and some, sometimes on extension six months after uh, April 15th. Um, so it goes without saying that between the cost and time frames involved, the average taxpayer, because we are talking about average properties uh, in today's day and age, are put in a position where they have to pay these increased taxes uh, without a substantive opportunity to be heard, and that effectively in today's day and age is taxation without representation. Happy at this point to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. We're going to hear from uh, the other gentleman, and then we will come back to questions. Good morning, uh, members of the Finance Committee. My name is Glenn Boren, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you on intro number 1038, which would change the 
minimum assessed value of income producing properties whose owners are required to obtain an audit in order to be heard by the New York City Tax Commission. Uh, I'm an attorney with the firm of Marcus and Pollock, LLP, which specializes in real estate tax matters. And my perspective on this issue is based on 12 years of private practice representing taxpayers before the tax mission and the courts, and the previous 25 years of public service, including service as counsel to the tax mission. The current law was added by local law number 27 for 1973 and remains as it was originally enacted. And as we've heard from the other speakers, over 45 years, inflation has expanded the audit requirement from a small group of substantial commercial properties to now cover a large group of relatively small properties. This inadvertent expansion of the requirement from what was originally intended is not a sound policy. A tax law that requires the taxpayer to go out and hire a CPA privately and pay for the audit is very unusual. We don't require this in the income tax where the owner's income statement directly determines the amount of tax they pay. By contrast, although income and expense statements from the owners are important to the property tax, they're not the final determinant of what is paid in taxes. Um, we first have the Department of Finance's tentative assessment, and then the owners have the right to contest the assessment before the tax mission, and if the matter is not resolved there, to go on to the court. At each level of that process, there's a determination of market value, which is appraisal of real estate. And appraisers and the people who, tr who make the decision on review consider multiple facts in making their determination of what the value of the property is. The burden is on the taxpayer to show the tax mission why the taxpayer's estimate of the market value is different for, and more accurate than the Department of Finance's estimate. Uh, in order to get that hearing before the tax commission, the owner has to certify the income and expenses for the property. The additional requirement of this law is that if it's over a million dollars in assessed value, they also need a certification by the CPA. That's a second certification on top of their own certification. Uh, the CPA, in order to give that certification, must conduct an audit for the period covered by the statement, which is usually the year ending December 31st of the immediately previous year. The statement has to be submitted no later than March 24th, so that allows less than 12 weeks from the closing of the books by the owner of that property until it has to be audited, certified, and filed together with the owner's own certification. In making its the determination the tax commission does certainly consider the income and expense statements, but it also has other information that is available to it, and things have changed a lot since 1973 in that regard. And in 86, the council adopted the law that requires the RPIE so that all owners have to report their income and expenses to the Department of Finance every year, whether or not they seek to have a review before the tax commission. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, le city council legislation expanded the hearing period from a short period that ended May 25th to more or less cover the entire year, uh, beginning with the publication of the role in January. Um, that has allowed the tax commission the ability to ask for additional information whenever it finds the information submitted by the taxpayer to leave them with questions that they're uncertain about. Um, so many, many owners of both large and small properties struggle with the filing deadline, the short time period that they have to get the certification done, and cost is an issue certainly for the small owners. Um, for the larger owners, they have the recourse of going to court. They can bypass the tax commission's review process uh, if they don't have the time to get this audit done. The small property owner 
Theoretically, they can do the same, but generally it's not a practical option. Um, so small owners are precluded from getting re meaningful review. You have a degradation of the quality of the assessments and of the public's acceptance of the property tax itself. Um, <coughs> The, the clients that in my firm <coughs> are, for the most part, owners of large properties and will not be affected by this in any significant way. However, the, you know, the updating of this law is in the public interest and I recommend its adoption. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee may have and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, just off the top of my head, do you agree with the indexing? Yes, I, I agree with both the concept of the indexing and the concerns that the President of the Tax Commission has, and I think that uh, you know, the, the primary goal here should certainly be correcting the 45 years uh, that's water under the bridge, but if there's a mechanism that's uh, practically effective, doing that going forward makes sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Grudenchik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the president of the tax commission, Ms. Hoffman, in her testimony today uh, suggested, and I'm looking for my numbers, I wrote them down and now I can't find them, but she suggested um, that over 6,000 businesses might um, actually save money uh, for this. And Mr. Blon, you had said that in your testimony that $10,000 is a, a reasonable number to expect to pay uh, a CPA to get these certified. Is that I wouldn't describe it as a reasonable number, but it's, I it's, a, I, well, it's a number I, my clients have heard all too often. <laughs> maybe not reasonable, maybe accurate number. And it, it could go it's much higher also. Very accurate. It would, it could, it, it's possible that it could go uh, much higher. Yes, I mean, I understand that part of the cost, um, the higher end costs are also because many of these businesses never utilized a certified public accountant before. And in order to have their paperwork alone in order for that level of an audit, Doing so in the time frame involved is, is equally as difficult as the cost, and part of the cost is that sort of combat pay to that big house accounting firm to stop what they're doing uh, in February and March of each year, which I don't have to tell you is their busiest time as well, uh, to take on a new client. They're not looking to uh, do so on a loss leader basis. So I misspoke before, Mr. Chairman. It's actually 18,296 businesses in the last year that we have information for, but so the potential savings there is almost $200 million for, for the property owners in this town. I would add there are, there are also some owners of property, longstanding owners of property familiar with this rule and unable to pay it or have their books certified in the time frame involved and may not be uh, protesting at this time. Okay, I appreciate that. And um, do you have an opinion on indexing versus you know, a, a regular set schedule that we would increase at $10,000 a year or something like that. I, I understand that inflation is low now, but we don't know that that won't, you know, we, I can remember inflation galloping along. I think that setting it on a, a, a certain uh, incremental basis uh, will have a problem over time for obvious reasons because let's say you set it at 50,000, what 50,000 is relative to 5 million today in another 10 years on a percentage basis, uh, the adjustments over time are going to trail uh, real inflation most likely. Um, I think the easiest way for the indexing component to work in conjunction with the task commission's concerns would be to use the trailing, uh, you know, CPI figure uh, and additionally round up to the nearest 100,000 to uh, avoid uh, confusion over what the benchmark is from year to year. Okay. I thank you uh, both for your testimony. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. If I may, one more thing, just on, on behalf of the taxpayers, um, we've been waiting, they've been waiting for, for, for 45 years for this, but uh, as, as President Hoffman alluded to, uh, if this law does not get updated uh, by uh, the next you know, month or two, uh, the reality is it will not be able to assist taxpayers until 2020. Well, it's our, my intention anyway. I hope it's the chair's intention and the speaker's intention uh, to get this done uh, quickly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, and we're working very closely with Councilmember Grudenchik to make this happen. So 
Thank you both for coming in. I appreciate your time and uh, commitment to this issue. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, this is a pretty quick hearing. I think that we are done. And with that, we are going to adjourn at 11.16 in the morning. Thank you. <laughs>